Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to The Well Told Tale. Every week we bring you the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. Today we return to Alice Through the Looking Glass. Alice is in the Looking Glass land, a land where everything is backwards, or back to front, or just plain odd. Indeed, Lewis Carroll was clearly playing with this idea of Through the Looking Glass being the opposite of Alice in Wonderland. That started outdoors on a warm day, the 4th of May. This started indoors on a cold day, the 4th of November, exactly half a year later. That had a theme of cards running through it, this chess and so on. And now we meet Tweedledum and Tweedledee, who are, well, you'll see. It's time to pull up a chair, relax and enjoy part two of Alice Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll. Chapter 4. Tweedledum and Tweedledee They were standing under a tree, each with an arm around the other's neck, and Alice knew which was which in a moment, because one of them had Dum embroidered on his collar, and the other D. I suppose they've each got Tweedle round at the back of the collar, she said to herself. They stood so still that she also quite forgot that they were alive, and she was just looking round to see if the word Tweedle was written at the back of each collar, when she was startled by a voice coming from the one marked Dumb. "'If you think we're waxworks,' he said, "'you ought to pay, you know. Waxworks weren't made to be looked at for nothing, no how.' "'Contrary-wise,' added the one marked D, "'if you think we're alive, you ought to speak.' "'I'm sure I'm very sorry,' was all Alice could say, for the words of the old song kept ringing through her head like the ticking of a clock, and she could hardly help saying them out loud. Tweedledum and Tweedledee agreed to have a battle, for Tweedledum said Tweedledee had spoiled his nice new rattle. Just then flew down a monstrous crow as black as a tar barrel, which frightened both the heroes so they quite forgot their quarrel. "'I know what you're thinking about,' said Tweedledum, "'but it isn't so, no how.' Contrarywise, continued Tweedledee, if it was so, it might be, and if it were so, it would be, but as it isn't, it ain't. That's logic. I was thinking, Alice said very politely, which is the best way out of this wood? It's getting so dark. Would you tell me, please? But the little men only looked at each other and grinned. They looked so exactly like a couple of great schoolboys that Alice couldn't help pointing her finger at Tweedledum and saying, First boy! No how, Tweedledum cried out briskly, then shut his mouth up again with a snap. Next boy, said Alice, passing on to Tweedledee, though she felt quite certain that he would only shout out contrary-wise, and he did so. You've been wrong, cried Tweedledum. The first thing in a visit is to say, how do you do, and shake hands. And here the two brothers gave each other a hug, and then they held out the two hands that were free to shake hands with her. Alice did not like shaking hands with either of them first, for fear of hurting the other one's feelings. As the best way out of this difficulty, she took hold of both hands at once. The next moment, they were dancing round in a ring. This seemed quite natural, she remembered afterwards, and she was not even surprised to hear music playing. It seemed to come from the tree under which they were dancing, and it was done, as well as she could make it out, by the branches rubbing one against another, like fiddles and fiddlesticks. But it certainly was funny, Alice said afterwards, when she was telling her sister the history of all this, to find myself singing, Here We Go Round the Mulberry Bush. I didn't know when I began it, but somehow I felt as if I'd been singing it for a long, long time. The other two dancers were fat and very soon out of breath. Four times round is enough for one dance, Tweedledum panted out, but they left off dancing as suddenly as they had begun. The music stopped at the same moment. Then they let go of Alice's hands and stood looking at her for a minute. There was a rather awkward pause, as Alice didn't know how to begin a conversation with people she had just been dancing with. It would never do to say, how do you do now, she said to herself. We seem to have got beyond that somehow. I hope you're not much tired, she said at last. No how, and thank you very much for asking, said Tweedledum. So much obliged, added Tweedledee. You like poetry? Uh, yes, pretty well. Some poetry, Alice said doubtfully. 
would you tell me which road leads out of the wood? What shall I repeat to her? said Tweedledee, looking round at Tweedledum with great solemn eyes and not noticing Alice's question. The walrus and the carpenter is the longest, Tweedledum replied, giving his brother an affectionate hug. Tweedledee began instantly. The sun was shining. Here Alice ventured to interrupt him. If it is very long, she said, as politely as she could, would you please tell me first which road... Tweedledee smiled gently and began again. The sun was shining on the sea, shining with all his might. He did his very best to make the billows smooth and bright, and this was odd, because it was the middle of the night. The moon was shining sulkily, because she thought the sun had got no business to be there after the day was done. It's very rude of him, she said, to come and spoil the fun. The sea was wet as wet could be, the sands were dry as dry, you could not see a cloud, because no cloud was in the sky. No birds were flying overhead, there were no birds to fly. The walrus and the carpenter were walking close at hand, they wept like anything to see such quantities of sand. If this were only cleared away, they said, it would be grand. If seven maids with seven mops swept it for half a year, do you suppose, the walrus said, that they could get it clear? I doubt it, said the carpenter, and shed a bitter tear. Oh, oysters, come and walk with us, the walrus did beseech. A pleasant walk, a pleasant talk, along the briny beach. We cannot do with more than four to give a hand to each. The eldest oyster looked at him, but never a word he said. The eldest oyster winked his eye and shook his heavy head, meaning to say he did not choose to leave the oyster bed. But four young oysters hurried up, all eager for the treat. Their coats were brushed, their faces washed, their shoes were clean and neat. And this was odd, because, you know, they hadn't any feet. Four other oysters followed them, and yet another four, and thick and fast they came at last, and more, and more, and more, all hopping through the frothy waves and scrambling to the shore. The walrus and the carpenter walked on a mile or so, and then they rested on a rock conveniently low, and all the little oysters stood and waited in a row. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot and whether pigs have wings. But wait a bit, the oysters cried, before we have our chat, for some of us are out of breath and all of us are fat. No hurry, said the carpenter, they thanked him much for that. A loaf of bread, the walrus said, is what we chiefly need. Pepper and vinegar besides are very good indeed. Now, if you're ready, oysters dear, we can begin to feed. But not on us, the oysters cried, turning a little blue. After such kindness, that would be a dismal thing to do. The night is fine, the walrus said. Do you admire the view? It was so kind of you to come, and you are very nice. The carpenter said nothing, but cut us another slice. I wish you were not quite so deaf. I've had to ask you twice. It seems a shame, the walrus said, to play them such a trick. After we've brought them out so far and made them trot so quick. The carpenter said nothing, but the butter's spread too thick. I weep for you, the walrus said. I deeply sympathise. With sobs and tears he sorted out those of the largest size, holding his pocket handkerchief before his streaming eyes. Oh, oysters, said the carpenter, you've had a pleasant run. Shall we be trotting home again? But answer came there none, and that was scarcely odd, because they'd eaten every one. I like the walrus best, said Alice, because... You see, he was a little sorry for the poor oysters. He ate more than the carpenter, though, said Tweedledee. You see, he held his handkerchief in front so that the carpenter couldn't count how many he took, contrary-wise. That was mean, Alice said indignantly. Then I like the carpenter best, if he didn't eat so many as the walrus. But he ate so many as he could get, said Tweedledum. This was a puzzler. After a pause, Alice began... "'Well, they were both very unpleasant characters. 
Here she checked herself in some alarm at hearing something that sounded to her like the puffing of a large steam engine in the wood near them, though she feared it was more likely to be a wild beast. "'Are there any lions or tigers about here?' she asked timidly. "'It's only the Red King snoring,' said Tweedledee. "'Come and look at him!' the brothers cried, and they each took one of Alice's hands and led her up to where the king was sleeping. "'Isn't he a lovely sight?' said Tweedledum. Alice couldn't say honestly that he was. He had a tall red nightcap on, with a tassel, and he was lying crumpled up into a sort of untidy heap and snoring loud. "'Fit to snore his head off,' as Tweedledum remarked. "'I'm afraid he'll catch cold with lying on the damp grass,' said Alice, who was a very thoughtful little girl. "'He's dreaming now,' said Tweedledee. "'And what do you think he's dreaming about?' Alice said, "'Nobody can guess that.' "'Why, about you,' Tweedledee exclaimed, clapping his hands triumphantly. "'And if he left off dreaming about you, where do you suppose you'd be?' "'Where I am now, of course,' said Alice. "'Oh, not you,' Tweedledee retorted contemptuously. "'You'd be nowhere. Why, you're only a sort of thing in his dream.' "'If their king was to wake,' added Tweedledum, "'you'd go out, bang, just like a candle.' "'I shouldn't,' Alice exclaimed indignantly. "'Besides, if I'm only a sort of thing in his dream, "'what are you, I should like to know?' "'Ditto,' said Tweedledum. "'Ditto, ditto,' cried Tweedledee. "'He shouted this so loud that Alice couldn't help saying, "'Hush, you'll be waking him, I'm afraid, if you make so much noise.' "'Well, it's no use your talking about waking him,' said Tweedledum. "'When you're only one of the things in his dream, you know very well you're not real.' "'I am real,' said Alice, and began to cry. "'You won't make yourself a bit realer by crying,' Tweedledee remarked. "'There's nothing to cry about.' "'If I wasn't real,' Alice said, half laughing through her tears, it all seemed so ridiculous, "'I shouldn't be able to cry.' "'I hope you don't suppose those are real tears,' Tweedledum interrupted in a tone of great contempt. "'I know they're just talking nonsense,' Alice thought to herself, "'and it's foolish to cry about it.' So she brushed away her tears and went on as cheerfully as she could. "'At any rate, I'd better be getting out of the wood, for really it's coming on very dark. "'Do you think it's going to rain?' Tweedledum spread a large umbrella over himself and his brother and looked up into it. "'No, I don't think it is,' he said. "'At least—' Not under here, no how. But it may rain outside? It may, if it chooses, said Tweedledee. We've no objection, contrary-wise. Selfish things, thought Alice, and she was just going to say good night and leave them when Tweedledum sprang out from under the umbrella and seized her by the wrist. Do you see that? he said in a voice choking with passion, and his eyes grew large and yellow all in a moment as he pointed with a trembling finger at a small white thing lying under the tree. "'It's only a rattle,' Alice said, after a careful examination of the little white thing. "'Not a rattlesnake, you know,' she added hastily, thinking he was frightened. "'Only a, an old rattle, quite old and broken.' "'I knew it was,' cried Tweedledum, beginning to stamp round wildly and tear his hair. "'It's spoilt, of course.' Here he looked at Tweedledee, who immediately sat down on the ground and tried to hide himself under the umbrella. Alice laid her hand on his arm and said in a soothing tone, "'You needn't be so angry about an old rattle.' "'But it isn't old!' Tweedledum cried, in a greater fury than ever. "'It's new, I tell you! I bought it yesterday! My nice new rattle!' His voice rose to a perfect scream. All this time Tweedledee was trying his best to fold up the umbrella with himself in it, which was such an extraordinary thing to do that it quite took off Alice's attention from the angry brother, but he couldn't quite succeed and it ended up in his rolling over, bundled up in the umbrella with only his head out, and there he lay, opening and shutting his mouth and his large eyes, looking more like a fish than anything else, Alice thought. "'Of course you agree to have a battle,' Tweedledum said in a calmer tone. "'I suppose so,' the other sulkily replied as he crawled out of the umbrella. "'Only she must help us to dress up, you know.' So the two brothers went off hand in hand into the wood and returned in a minute with their arms full of things, such as bolsters, blankets, hearth rugs, tablecloths, dish covers and coal scuttles. "'I hope you're a good hand at pinning and tying things.' Tweedledum remarked. Every one of these things has got to go on, somehow or other. 
Alice said afterwards that she had never seen such a fuss made about anything in her life. The way these two bustled about, and the quantity of things they put on, and the trouble they gave her in tying strings and fastening buttons. Really, they'll be more like bundles of old clothes than anything else by the time they're ready, she said to herself, as she arranged a bolster around the neck of Tweedledee. To keep his head from being cut off, as he said. You know, he added very gravely, it's one of the most serious things that can possibly happen to one in a battle to get one's head cut off. Alice laughed aloud, but she managed to turn it into a cough for fear of hurting his feelings. Do I look very pale? said Tweedledum, coming up to have his helmet tied on. He called it a helmet, though it certainly looked much more like a saucepan. Well, yes, a little, replied Alice gently. I'm very brave, generally, he went on in a low voice. Only today I happen to have a headache. And I've got a toothache, said Tweedledee, who had overheard the remark. I'm far worse off than you. Then you'd better not fight today, said Alice, thinking it a good opportunity to make peace. We must have a bit of a fight, but I don't care about going on long, said Tweedledum. What's the time now? Tweedledee looked at his watch and said, Half past four. "'Let's fight till six, and then have dinner,' said Tweedledum. "'Very well,' the other said, rather sadly. "'And she can watch us. "'Only you'd better not come very close,' he added. "'I generally hit everything I can see when I get really excited.' "'And I hit everything within reach,' cried Tweedledum, "'whether I can see it or not.' Alice laughed. "'You must hit the trees pretty often, I should think,' she said. Tweedledum looked round him with a satisfied smile. I don't suppose, he said, there'll be a tree left standing for ever so far around by the time we've finished. And all about a rattle, said Alice, still hoping to make them a little ashamed of fighting for such a trifle. I shouldn't have minded it so much, said Tweedledum, if it hadn't been a new one. I wish the monstrous crow would come, thought Alice. There's only one sword, you know, Tweedledum said to his brother, but you can have the umbrella, it's quite as sharp, only we must begin quick, it's getting as dark as it can. And darker, said Tweedledee. It was getting dark so suddenly that Alice thought there must be a thunderstorm coming on. What a thick black cloud that is, she said, and how fast it comes. Why, I do believe it's got wings. It's the crow! Tweedledum cried out in a shrill voice of alarm, and the two brothers took to their heels and were out of sight in a moment. Alice ran a little way into the wood and stopped under a large tree. It can never get at me here, she thought. It's far too large to squeeze in amongst all the trees. But I wish it wouldn't flap its wings so. It makes quite a hurricane in the wood. Here's somebody's shawl being blown away. Chapter 5 Wool and Water she caught the shawl as she spoke, and looked about for the owner. In another moment, the White Queen came running wildly through the wood, with both arms stretched out wide as if she were flying, and Alice, very civilly, went to meet her with the shawl. "'I'm very glad I happened to be in the way,' Alice said, as she helped her to put her shawl on again. The White Queen only looked at her in a helpless, frightened sort of way, and kept repeating something in a whisper to herself that sounded like, "'Bread and butter! Bread and butter!' and Alice felt that if there was to be any conversation at all, she must manage it herself, so she began rather timidly. "'Am I addressing the White Queen?' "'Well, yes, if you call that a dressing,' the Queen said. "'It isn't my notion of the thing at all.' Alice thought it would never do to have an argument at the very beginning of their conversation, so she smiled and said, "'If your Majesty will only tell me the right way to begin, I'll do it as well as I can.' "'But I don't want it done at all,' groaned the poor Queen. "'I've been addressing myself for the last two hours.' "'It would have been all the better, as it seemed to Alice, "'if she had got someone else to dress her. "'She was so dreadfully untidy. "'Every single thing's crooked,' Alice thought to herself, "'and she's all over pins. "'May I put your shawl straight for you?' she added aloud. "'I don't know what's the matter with it,' said the Queen in a melancholy voice. "'It's out of temper, I think. I've pinned it here and I've pinned it there, but there's no pleasing it.' "'It can't go straight, you know, if you pin it all on one side,' Alice said, as she gently put it on right for her. "'And dear me, what a state your hair is in!' "'The brush has got entangled in it,' the Queen said with a sigh, "'and I lost the comb yesterday.' Alice carefully released the brush and did her best to get the hair into order. 
come, you look rather better now, she said, after altering most of the pins, but really you should have a lady's maid. I'm sure I'll take you with pleasure, the Queen said, twopence a week and jam every other day. Alice couldn't help laughing as she said, I don't want you to hire me and I don't care for jam. It's very good jam, said the Queen. Well, I don't want any today at any rate. Well, you couldn't have it if you did want it, the Queen said. The rule is jam tomorrow and jam yesterday, but never jam today. It must come sometimes to jam today, Alice objected. No, it can't, said the Queen. It's jam every other day. Today isn't any other day, you know. I don't understand you, said Alice. It's dreadfully confusing. And that's the effect of living backwards, the Queen said kindly. It always makes one a little giddy at first. Living backwards, Alice repeated in great astonishment. I never heard of such a thing. But there's one great advantage in it, that one's memory works both ways. I'm sure mine only works one way, Alice remarked. I can't remember things before they happen. It's a poor sort of memory that only works backwards, the Queen remarked. What sort of things do you remember best? Alice ventured to ask. Oh, things that happened the week after next, the Queen replied in a careless tone. For instance, now, she went on, sticking a large piece of plaster on her finger as she spoke. There's the King's messenger. He's in prison now, being punished, and the trial doesn't even begin until next Wednesday. And, of course, the crime comes last of all. Suppose he never commits the crime, said Alice. That would be all the better, wouldn't it? the Queen said, as she bound the plaster around her finger with a bit of ribbon. Alice felt there was no denying that. Of course it would be all the better, she said, but it wouldn't be all the better his being punished. You're very wrong there, at any rate, the Queen said. Were you ever punished? Only for faults, said Alice. And you were all the better for it, I know, the Queen said triumphantly. Well, yes, but then I had done the things that I was punished for, said Alice. That makes all the difference. But if you hadn't done them, the Queen said, that would have been better still, better and better and better. Her voice went higher with each better till it got quite to a squeak at last. Alice was just beginning to say, there's a mistake somewhere, when the Queen began screaming so loud that she had to leave the sentence unfinished. Oh, oh, oh shouted the Queen, shaking her hand about as if she wanted to shake it off. My finger's bleeding! Oh! 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 Her screams were so exactly like the whistle of a steam engine that Alice had to hold both her hands over her ears. What is the matter? she said, as soon as there was a chance of making herself heard. Have you pricked your finger? I haven't pricked it yet, the Queen said, but I shall soon. Oh! 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 "'When do you expect to do it?' Alice asked, feeling very much inclined to laugh. "'When I fasten my shawl again,' the poor Queen groaned out. "'The brooch will come undone directly. Oh! Oh!' As she said the words, the brooch flew open, and the Queen clutched wildly at it and tried to clasp it again. "'Take care,' cried Alice. "'You're holding it all crooked.' And she caught at the brooch, but it was too late. The pin had slipped, and the Queen had pricked her finger. "'That accounts for the bleeding, you see,' she said to Alice with a smile. "'Now you understand the way things happen here.' "'But why don't you scream now?' Alice said, holding her hands ready to put over her ears again. "'Why, I've done all the screaming already,' said the Queen. "'What would be the good of having it all over again?' By this time it was getting light. "'The crow must have flown away, I think,' said Alice. "'I'm so glad it's gone. I thought it was the night coming on.' "'I wish I could manage to be glad,' the Queen said. "'Only I never can remember the rule. "'You must be very happy living in this wood "'and being glad whenever you like.' "'Only it is so very lonely here,' Alice said in a melancholy voice, "'and at the thought of her loneliness two large tears came rolling down her cheeks. "'Oh, don't go on like that,' cried the poor Queen, wringing her hands in despair. "'Consider what a great girl you are. Consider what a long way you've come today. Consider what o'clock it is. Consider anything. Only don't cry.' Alice could not help laughing at this, even in the midst of her tears. "'Can you keep from crying by considering things?' she said. "'That's the way it's done,' the Queen said with great decision. "'Nobody can do two things at once, you know. "'Let's consider your age to begin with. "'How old are you?' "'I'm seven and a half exactly.' 
You needn't say exactly, the Queen remarked. I can believe it without that. Now, I'll give you something to believe. I'm just one hundred and one, five months and a day. I can't believe that, said Alice. Can't you? the Queen said in a pitying tone. Try again. Draw a long breath and shut your eyes. Alice laughed. There's no use trying, she said. One can't believe impossible things. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the Queen. When I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. There goes the shawl again. The brooch had come undone as she spoke, and a sudden gust of wind blew the Queen's shawl across a little brook. The Queen spread out her arms again and went flying after it, and this time she succeeded in catching it for herself. "'I've got it!' she cried in a triumphant tone. "'Now you shall see me pin it on again, all by myself.' "'Then I hope your finger is better now,' Alice said very politely as she crossed the little brook after the Queen." "'Oh, much better!' cried the Queen, her voice rising to a squeak as she went. "'Much better! 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 Better!' The last word ended in a long bleat, so like a sheep that Alice quite started. She looked at the Queen, who seemed to have suddenly wrapped herself up in wool. Alice rubbed her eyes and looked again. She couldn't make out what had happened at all. Was she in a shop? And was that really... Was it really a sheep that was sitting on the other side of the counter? Rub as she could, she could make nothing more of it. She was in a little dark shop, leaning with her elbows on the counter, and opposite to her was an old sheep, sitting in an armchair, knitting, and every now and then leaving off to look at her through a great pair of spectacles. "'What is it you want to buy?' the sheep said at last, looking up for a moment from her knitting. "'I... "'Don't quite know yet,' Alice said very gently. "'I should like to look all around me first, if I might. "'You may look in front of you and on both sides, if you like,' said the sheep. "'But you can't look all around you unless you've got eyes in the back of your head.' But these, as it happened, Alice had not got, so she contented herself with turning round, looking at the shelves as she came to them. The shop seemed to be full of all manner of curious things, but the oddest part of it all was that whenever she looked hard at any shelf to make out exactly what it had on it, that particular shelf was always quite empty, though the others round it were crowded as full as they could hold. "'Things flow about here so,' she said at last in a plaintive tone, after she had spent a minute or so in vainly pursuing a large bright thing that looked sometimes like a doll and sometimes like a workbox, and was always in the shelf next above the one she was looking at. And this one is the most provoking of all, but I'll tell you what,' she added, as a sudden thought struck her, "'I'll follow it up to the very top shelf of all. It'll puzzle it to go through the ceiling, I expect.' But even this plan failed— the thing went through the ceiling as quietly as possible, as if it were quite used to it. "'Are you a child or a teetotum?' the sheep said as she took up another pair of needles. "'You'll make me giddy soon if you go on turning round like that.' She was now working with fourteen pairs at once, and Alice couldn't help looking at her in great astonishment. "'How can she knit with so many?' the puzzled child thought to herself. "'She gets more and more like a porcupine every minute.' "'Can you row?' the sheep asked, handing her a pair of knitting needles as she spoke. "'Yes, a little, but not on land, and not with needles,' Alice was beginning to say, when suddenly the needles turned into oars in her hands, and she found that they were in a little boat, gliding along between banks, so there was nothing for it but to do her best. "'Feather!' cried the sheep as she took up another pair of needles. This didn't sound like a remark that needed any answer, so Alice said nothing but pulled away. There was something very queer about the water, she thought, as every now and then the oars got fast in it and would hardly come out again. "'Feather! Feather!' the sheep cried again, taking more needles. "'You'll be catching a crab directly.' "'A dear little crab,' thought Alice. "'I should like that.' "'Didn't you hear me say, Feather?' the sheep cried angrily, taking up quite a bunch of needles. "'Indeed I did,' said Alice. "'You said it very often and very loud. "'Please, where are the crabs?' "'In the water, of course,' said the sheep, "'sticking some of the needles into her hair as her hands were full. "'Feather!' I say. "'Why do you say feather so often?' Alice asked at last, rather vexed. "'I'm not a bird.' "'You are?' said the sheep, 
You're a little goose. This offended Alice a little, so there was no more conversation for a minute or two while the boat glided gently on, sometimes among beds of weeds, which made the oars stick fast in the water, worse than ever, and sometimes under trees, but always with the same tall riverbanks frowning over their heads. Oh, please, there are some scented rushes, Alice cried in a sudden transport of delight. Uh, There really are, and such beauties. You needn't say please to me about them the sheep said, without looking up from her knitting. I didn't put them there, and I'm not going to take them away. No, but I meant, please, may we wait and pick some, Alice pleaded, if you don't mind stopping the boat for a minute. How am I to stop it, said the sheep. If you leave off rowing, it'll stop of itself. So the boat was left to drift down the stream as it would, till it glided gently in among the waving rushes. And then the little sleeves were carefully rolled up and the little arms were plunged in elbow deep to get the rushes a good long way down before breaking them off. And for a while Alice forgot all about the sheep and the knitting as she bent over the side of the boat with just the ends of her tangled hair dipping into the water, while with bright eager eyes she caught at one bunch after another of the darling scented rushes. "'I only hope the boat won't tipple over,' she said to herself. "'Oh, what a lovely one!' only I couldn't quite reach it. And it certainly did seem a little provoking, almost as if it happened on purpose, she thought, that though she managed to pick plenty of beautiful rushes as the boat glided by, there was always a more lovely one that she couldn't reach. The prettiest ones are always further, she said at last, with a sigh at the obstinacy of the rushes in growing so far off, as with flushed cheeks and dripping hair and hands, she scrambled back into her place and began to arrange her newfound treasures. What battered it to her just then that the rushes had begun to fade and to lose their scent and beauty from the very moment that she picked them? Even real scented rushes, you know, last only a very little while, and these, being dream rushes, melted away almost like snow as they lay in heaps at her feet. But Alice hardly noticed this, and there were so many other curious things to think about. They hadn't gone much further before the blade of one of the oars got fast in the water and wouldn't come out again, so Alice explained it afterward, and the consequence was that the handle of it caught her under the chin, and in spite of a series of little shrieks of, "'Oh! Oh! Oh!' from poor Alice, it swept her straight off the seat and down among the heap of rushes. However, she wasn't hurt and was soon up again. The sheep went on with her knitting all the while, just as if nothing had happened. "'That was a nice crab you caught,' she remarked, as Alice got back into her place, very much relieved to find herself still in the boat. "'Was it? I didn't see it,' said Alice, peeping cautiously over the side of the boat into the dark water. "'I wish I hadn't let it go.' I should so like to see a little crab to take home with me. But the sheep only laughed scornfully and went on with her knitting. Are there many crabs here? said Alice. Crabs and all sorts of things, said the sheep. Plenty of choice. Only make up your mind. Now, what do you want to buy? To buy? Alice echoed in a tone that was half astonished and half frightened, for the oars and the boat and the river had vanished all in a moment, and she was back again in the little dark shop. "'I should like to buy an egg, please,' she said timidly. "'How do you sell them?' Five pence farthing for one, two pence for two, the sheep replied. "'Then two are cheaper than one?' Alice said in a surprised tone, taking out her purse. "'Only you must eat them both if you buy two, said the sheep." "'Then I'll have one, please,' said Alice, as she put the money down on the counter, for she thought to herself, "'They mightn't be at all nice, you know.' The sheep took the money and put it away in a box. Then she said, "'I never put things into people's hands. That would never do. You must get it for yourself.' So saying, she went off to the other end of the shop and set the egg upright on a shelf. I wonder why it wouldn't do, thought Alice, as she groped her way among the tables and chairs, for the shop was very dark towards the end. The egg seems to get further away the more I walk towards it. Let me see, is this a chair? Why, it's got branches, I declare. How very odd to find trees growing here, and actually, here's a little brook. Well, this is the very queerest shop I ever saw. So she went on, wondering more and more at every step, as everything turned into a tree the moment she came to it and she quite expected the egg to do the same.
and welcome back. I hope you enjoyed part two of Alice Through the Looking Glass. If you did enjoy it, then please consider supporting The Well Told Tale on Patreon at patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale. There's a link in the description. I'll be back next week with part three of this tale, and Humpty Dumpty. I hope you can join me. <laughs>